Jesus is. This whole series is about answering that question. And this morning, when the worship team began to lead us with, that's my king, I pray you can fill in the blank, Jesus is my king. What, isn't our worship team unbelievable? I mean, let's, let's give praise to the Lord, but God uses them. And they can hear. They're back there. Some I'm, I don't know. They may be at McDonald's. But anyway, they, they're somewhere over there. This is what we desire. For you to come into this place. For you to join this stream. And to learn something about Jesus that you didn't know. Or somehow take something you already knew. And for the first time, line up your life with it. And live it. This week of all weeks is a week where I want us to live that experience as much as we possibly can through the Word and through worship tonight, breaking bread tonight, having communion, and setting up the week, the Holy Week, the most important week in history. It changed everything. And we know exactly when the week was. We're not sure when Jesus was born. Pretty sure it wasn't at Christmas, you know? But we know when He died. Because we know when Passover happened that year. We know how everything transpired. On this day, Palm Sunday, what did Jesus do? Anybody remember? He rode in. He rode on a donkey into the city of Jerusalem. And the people were lined up. And they were singing something. They were shouting something. What was it? Hosanna. Hosanna. And they welcomed him into the city. Now, they might not have known exactly what, what they were saying. Hosanna means God save us. They might have been thinking save us from Rome, but Jesus came to save us from another tyrant, ourself. He came to break the captives free from sin and the dominion of darkness. They didn't quite get it, but it wouldn't be long. He would show them. So Sunday he rides in, Thursday night, he gathers his disciples, and they break bread together. He first washes their feet, and they are just blown away by that. Then he begins to talk about there's one of them going to betray him. And he literally washed Judas' feet. And then he began some of the greatest teaching that we have in all the New Testament. John 14, 15, 16, and 17. All of that, when you read that, <clears throat> in fact, let me encourage you to read it this week. That happened one night when he was preparing them for him to be crucified. He tried to teach them things. One of the things he taught them is in 14. He looked at them and he said, your hearts are troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in me. You believe in God, believe in me also. And he gives one of the greatest teachings about who he is. And this is where we get that incredible saying from Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man will come to the Father but through me. I want you to open up a copy of God's Word or in your phone, get it to John 14. Chapter 14, verse 1. Now, here's what's interesting while you're turning there. One of the greatest truths that he ever spoke, I'm the way, truth, and life, he answers a question. If you'd go back to the New Testament sometime and think about how many times Jesus or Paul, the apostle, wrote some of the greatest material answering a question. And I, I think sometimes, gosh, what if they hadn't asked that question? I mean, what if we, if those churches hadn't asked Paul about those things? Here's what I believe. God's not afraid of your questions. You may be in this room and you've never really been to church much. You've never really been a religious person in your language. You, you would say you're kind of seeking. Can I just tell you he's not afraid of your questions? Man, you ask him anything you want. Because in, when in the text, there's a question and Jesus answers with this incredible teaching. So what I want to do is I want to read it in just a minute with you, but I want to show you where we're going. Because the answer he gave to the question and what he's trying to say to them, three things. 
Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the ultimate truth. Jesus is the source of life. You see these three truths? You don't have to know much more than just that. That's the essence of our faith. I mean, those truths will help you in any situation, anything you go through. There's the truth. As I say, it'll keep you crispy in milk. No matter what life does to you, you will hang on to these truths and be anchored in these truths. So let's look at it as Jesus said this to them. We'll start in verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. See the word troubled? It's the word to describe your heart when you don't know what to do. Or when you are really concerned, you're really torn. There's something, there's anguish going on. He knew, he knew they were really, they knew something was coming. They didn't know what it was. It's Thursday night. He's crucified on Friday. I follow the traditional chronology of the week. And I just think Jesus knew how they were so upset. He spoke directly to them. He said, don't let your heart be troubled. In fact, it's the best way to translate it is stop being troubled. Stop being troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many, what? Rooms. Now, some of you, how many of you grew up thinking that was mansions? In my Father's house are many mansions. You know, that's King James, and that's what a lot of us grew up with, many mansions. We'll talk about that in just a second. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. I think he's making a statement. I don't think it's a question. I think it's a statement. ESV chooses that. I would say, he just says to them, hey, if it weren't so, I would have told you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Now, that's the conversation that is at the beginning. Okay, so imagine they're, they're probably in a room. Some believe they could have been walking on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. I think probably you're still in that room where they were when they broke bread together, the upper room. And so he's trying to tell them something. He's saying, hey, I don't want you to be troubled. Just trust me. Trust me. I'm going to go do something pretty cool. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And guess what? I'm coming back. And I'm going to receive you to myself so that where I am also, what does that mean? Well, we're going to meet him either in death or when he comes. He, he's going to be the first one we see. You know, I believe when somebody, and you probably maybe had a loved one to die, I believe whenever they die, the first thing they see, they open their eyes immediately. They don't go through a tunnel and somebody yelling, follow the light and all that nonsense. Jesus is there. And he's just going to reach down and say, David, come on. I got your room ready. Room. A room? Yeah. In the Father's house. And he's got a big, big yard. Y'all remember that song? You remember that? Audio Adrenaline? My middle son, we were at a concert. Audio Adrenaline was playing, and we were sitting somewhere close, and they just picked him out of the lineup, I guess, out of all the people, and got him up on the stage to help sing that song. That song helps us understand we have a place in the Father's house. Now, I know some of you, like I said, grew up with the idea of mansion. What about that mansion? I was hoping I'm going to get a mansion. Well, let me tell you something. I don't think you're going to be disappointed. I think you're going to love what he has prepared for you. You know why? I know why. And that is, it doesn't matter if it's a room, it's a mansion, it's where Jesus is. And he wants you to be with him. Isn't that awesome? I just think that's one of the coolest things. My wife and I, when we first got married, we, she grew up in a great family. Her dad was a doctor, lived in a modest home, but it was very nice. I did the same. My dad was a pastor, and we lived in a nice place. You know what our first home was? We got back from a little short honeymoon. We moved in a mobile trailer, a mobile home. It was 10 feet wide and 50 feet long. Now, just do the math. You probably got bathrooms bigger than that trailer was. I mean, it it was tiny. 
The bedrooms, all they were was a bed. I mean, you couldn't, you didn't have room to walk around. You just walked to the door and fell in bed. That's the way you did it. But you know what we thought? It was a mansion. You know why? It was our home. Rachel was there with me. I was there with her. What else did we need? We're newlyweds. It was home. It was a mansion, right? It's not about brick and mortar. It's not about what's outside. It's the one who's there with you. Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to be there. And guess what? I'm coming back to get you. And when I come back to get you, I'm going to take you home. And we're going to be there forever. I mean, this is the way he's assuring them. He's calming them down. And I think it's a beautiful promise. When your heart's troubled, when you don't know what the next day is going to hold, when you're not sure how you're going to make it through, remember these words. Jesus wants to say to you this morning, hey, I got you. And I'm preparing a place, and, and one day it's going to be okay, and it's going to be better than anything you've ever experienced here. You just trust me, and you believe in me. And then Thomas, of all people, Thomas, who was not a doubter. We call him Doubting Thomas because of one moment in his life, okay? I don't think it's fair to Thomas. He, he just asked a question in this situation. Look at the question that he asked. Thomas said, Lord... We do not know where you're going, which I would have said that. How do they know? They've never had this conversation with anybody. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to them, say it with me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Boom. I mean, that was the moment. Now, they may not have fully grasped it. I'm not sure we do either. Can we just take that and look at that for a second? You know how that really ought to be spoken? It ought to be I alone because there's a preposition there and the way that it's structured that's very emphatic. Jesus saying I alone am. Notice the definite article, the way, the truth, the life. He's not saying I'm one of the ways. He's not saying, I'm one of the truths out there. No, no, he's saying, I'm it. I am the way. I am the truth. And I'm the life. So what does that mean for us? How do we live that? How do we apply that, especially a week when we are honoring what the Lord did for us? Well, first of all, I think Jesus is saying, I'm the only way. I'm the only way. And I can tell you what people think when they hear that. Oh, you're one of those narrow-minded Christians. Think He's the only way to heaven. Yeah. Sorry. I just believe what Jesus said. And until he tells me otherwise, I believe that. But I don't think he's talking about necessarily just the way to heaven. I think he's talking about the way, period. Now, now think about this. Jesus could have come and shown us the way. There are a lot of great religious leaders that have been on this earth that have started movements. I mean, you can name them all over, all over the earth. But every one of those religious leaders, they always taught the way. They always showed the way. They always pointed the way. Only one said, I am the way. His name is Jesus. He is the way. It's not about a set of doctrine you got to believe it's not about a a a practice at church or it's not about a ritual no 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 he's not he's not talking about that he's basically saying guys i'm it i'm the way now let me show you the difference Uh, my wife uh, just got back from skiing with uh, some of the family out in steamboat springs in colorado so my middle son and his wife and our grandchildren went out, and uh, Rachel went with them, and my oldest son, Joshua, went with them. So Rachel is an incredible skier. That, In fact, uh, early on in our marriage, I went with her family, and um, I was learning, but they were incredible skiers. Rachel was probably the best of the whole group. And so she told me before she left, she said, I'm not sure I'm going to ski, but, but I'm going to go and help and whatever. Well, she got out there, and I knew it would happen. Snow was beautiful, everybody's skiing, and she said, I'm going to get my skis. 
So she gets her skis and she gets the boots. And if you've never snow skied, it's the most cumbersome, most awkward sport in the world. And expensive. But anyway, she got all that stuff. And then she realized, I don't have a lift ticket. You have to have a ticket to get on those gondolas or get on those chair lifts to take you up to the top of the mountain. She goes, oh my, where are they? Where do I get it? And she talked to this guy behind the register. He said, well, you're going to have to go. And he started to tell her. And then he did this. He goes, hey, why don't I just take you? Just go with me. She said, okay. So this guy's walking her. He's walking her along the way, showing her where to go. And he says, hey, by the way, I've got a code. When you buy your ticket, give them this code. The code was 90% off. 90% off. And she goes, she gets her lift ticket. She was so amazed that this guy would do that. She ended up later going back to that little shop and making sure she found him and he was busy. And she just looked at him and said, thank you. Now, it would have been easy for him to just say, okay, you just, you just go over there and you're going to have to go around that building and then you have to go find... Which would you prefer? Somebody just pointing you in the right direction or somebody saying, hey, just follow me. I'll go with you. Well, if that, is, is that what you prefer? Well, then I got a recommendation. You ought to try Jesus because that's what he does. He said, I am the way. Just go with me. And by the way, he's got a code too. It's not 90% off. It's 100% off. He covered it all. Every bit of it. Think about what that means for us living. I mean, how many of you have ever gotten lost on this campus? You got lost or you didn't know where you parked or something like that? I mean, we found a guy last week in one of the rooms, a deacon from three years ago. I mean, we didn't know where he went. (laughs) Just kidding. But we lose people. Do you think it's better for one of our helpers to go, hey, go that way? Or to say, come on, let me take you. My first time to visit the prisons here, almost 20 years ago, I went out to the reception center, the receiving center out on off the beach line, and I'm scared to death. I don't mind telling you. Man, I'm like, gosh, I don't know what's about to happen. And so they knew I was coming, and and I pull up, park, and I start walking in, and man, here comes this big old guard, this black guy. He comes out. I mean, he's huge. He picks me up. He grabs me, hugs me. And he picks me up and he said, man, I've been waiting for you. I'm so blessed to meet you. I watch you on TV and all. It was a great, great moment. And then he said this. He said, Pastor David, stay with me. Just whatever you do, if anybody asks you, what are you doing? You just say, I'm with him. First little thing we came to, there was a lady behind the glass. She's looking at me like, what are you doing here? And I kept going, I'm with him. I'm with him. I'm with him. With the next little place we got to. I'm with him. I'm with him. Man, do you know how that made me feel? Man, it felt so good saying, I'm I'm with him. (laughs) I can't wait till the day I stand at the gates. And they go, hey, who are you? What's going on? And I say, I'm with him. His name is Jesus. I'm with him. Now, it's not going to happen that way, but you know what I'm talking about. What's even better Jesus is going to say, he's with me. And that's even better. That's the point. Jesus is the way. Follow Jesus. He will take you there. Now, some people read this and they get a little upset that he said he's the only way. That's what Jesus said. I don't know why we get all torqued over that. I don't know why we get all upset and Christians get accused of being limited and narrow-minded. Well, is Disney narrow-minded? Doug Hankins told a story two weeks ago of a ticket that he thought worked and they wouldn't let him in because you've got to have the right ticket. When you go to a concert, you just can't walk in and pick any seat you want. You have a ticket. You've got to go to a certain seat. Every ball, every ball game, every soccer game. I mean, come on, folks. We live in a world that you have to have the right ticket for the right seat. Can I just tell you that The reason he's the only way 
to the Father is He's the only one who's done for you what He did. He took your sin on Himself and was crucified on a cross this Friday, Good Friday, and on the third day walked out of the grave. So He says, hey, I got you. You follow me, and He's the only one that can get you there. The only one who can beat death. Has anybody else ever come back from the grave? If you know somebody else that's out there walking around that was dead for three days, I want to meet them. Jesus is the only one who ever did that for me. So guess what? I can agree with him. He's the only way. And he's the ultimate truth. What does it mean he's the ultimate truth? Well, I think it means he's a truth that doesn't need any other circumstance or context. It's always true. It's called an absolute truth, okay? C.S. Lewis uh, calls Jesus the absolute reality. Here's what I mean. Do y'all know some truths that are dependent on something, okay? Uh, let, I'll give you an example. I played basketball, started out when I was young. How many of you think, and we got an NCAA tournament happening right now, so maybe your team's winning, maybe it isn't, and maybe you don't care either way. A goal, a round goal, the object of basketball is to make the ball go through the goal. How many of you believe that is the truth of basketball? That's the idea. Let me see your hand. Okay. How many of you believe that's an absolute truth? That, in other words, that's it. You, you don't get a point any other way. Believe it? Yeah. You're wrong. It's not an absolute. You know why? It depends on which goal you are talking about. Uh-huh. I know this by personal experience. <laughs> my first game ever to play for my school. I get in the game. I'm so excited. I get the ball. I drive to the bucket and score on the wrong end. <laughs> so do you know what the referee does? He walks over. He puts his arm around me. He said, son, you know you shot at the wrong goal. <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, good shot, by the way, but you shot at the wrong goal. You see, there are truths that depend on things. I remember as an athlete, they told us take salt tablets all the time. You've got to take salt tablets. You're not going to be, you know, at your best till you take. Then I heard, no, no, you don't take salt tablets. No, nobody needs more salt. What's the deal? There's all kind of truths. And then there's another truth. And then this truth said, no, that truth's not right. We live in a world of relativity. But there's one truth that will never change. Jesus Christ is Lord. You can always count on it. You can always depend on it. And let me tell you, when it comes in, really, the most impactful. When you don't know what to do. And when your best friends have turned their back on you, when somebody's lied to you, when somebody misled you, when somebody deceived you, all the stuff that can happen, man, there's one place I love to run, and that's Jesus, because I know he will never fail. He is the absolute truth. And when you have a crisis, my, my mom, one night at Christmas, Rachel and I were there, and I, I can't remember the kids, if we had uh, Joshua, our oldest, he was young. It was a long time ago. She began to seizure. And we're all sitting around as a family, enjoying family time, and she began to seizure. And I looked at her. Her eyes rolled back in her head. I'm, I, I, I didn't know what was happening. We got her in the car immediately, rushed her to a hospital in the emergency room, and waited out there. And then a doctor came out and said, um, we really don't know what's going on with her. We don't know what's happened. And if you want to see her, you need to come now. And so we went in. My dad looked at me and he said, would you pray over your mom? And I'm like, Dad, I'll try. And so what I didn't know is she had a syndrome called Stephen Johnson syndrome. That means you're very allergic to certain medications. For her, it was sulfur-based drugs like antibiotics that are made from sulfur like uh, Bactrim was the drug she was taking and she was dying and I will never forget that moment standing there by her bed and trying to think what do I pray I mean I'm asking God to heal her but I remember these words Jesus I don't know what's going on 
I don't know what's going to happen the next minute, hour, or day. But I know one thing will never change, and that is, Jesus, you are Lord. And I trust you. I believe in you. And that night taught me something. When I say Jesus is the ultimate truth, when he said I am the truth, that means no matter time of day or no matter what's going on, his truth never changes. Can we give him praise for that? Just give him thanks. Never changes. And the last, he's the source of life. You realize you're here this morning because of Jesus? He's the creator. I mean, all life comes from him. He's the author of life. Let me show you. Out of Paul's letter to the Colossians, he writes this uh, verse that's just mind-boggling. He says that we all came from Jesus, and we're all here because of Jesus, and our life should be lived for Jesus. Look at this. For by him, that's Jesus, all things were created. In heaven on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones and dominions or rulers or authorities. Who is that? Dominions, rulers, authorities. You know what he's talking about? The demons. He's talking about hell. I mean, he's talking about Satan and his entourage. You say, Jesus created them? Yes. And they rebelled and led the rebellion. And they are still in rebellion against him. But it, they were created by Jesus, just like we were. All things were created through him and for him. This is how you got here. This is why you're here. You got here through Jesus, but you're here for Jesus. And he is before all things, and in, all, in him all things what? Hold together. He's the glue. He's what makes your life work, your body work. He's what keeps the planets in place. He's what keeps the stars up there. I mean, everything. This verse tells me everything. So I know why you're here today. Because Jesus wants you here. When you woke up this morning, are you the reason you could get out of bed? No. Jesus is. Jesus is the reason for every day of your life. He is life. And he is the source of life. And so for me, that says to me, if I recognize every day is because of him and for him, I'm going to live it for him. I'm going to live my life in a way that honors him. And by the way, spiritual life, the word is zoe. That's the Greek word for life. There's another one, suke is one, and then another one, bios. Biology comes from that one. But this one's Zoe, which means our spiritual life. Look what Jesus or John wrote about Jesus, about if you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have the Son, you don't. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Now, notice, you can be on this planet and not have the Son of God, and you don't have life, but you're alive. How do you explain that? You're existing. Bios. Biology, but you don't have true spiritual life. You don't have life that's going to be from now on. You, you don't have abundant life. You don't have the life that Jesus came to bring us. So this morning, it's a real simple question. Do you have Jesus? If you do, you got life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. And when you have Jesus, he knows about everything that's going to happen today. Because he is the reason for your life. And that gives me such great comfort. Paul said in Acts 17, in him we move, live, and have our being. I'm, that's why I'm here, is because of Jesus. So I got a call this week from my heart surgeon, and I typically take that call whenever she calls. She just said, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing good, actually. She said, I just was thinking about you. i met one of your members of the church. By the way, she's here whenever she can be here, and she watches when she can't be. And said, uh, I, I, they just inspired me because they have just a deep faith like you and Rachel have. And she said, oh, and by the way, uh, they, they had a pillow. They got a pillow. Because you, when you have a heart, open heart surgery, they crack your sternum. And so when they wire it back, you're going to be really, really, uh, it's going to be hard for you to sneeze <laughs> or cough or anything because of the pain. So you have a pillow that you hold, and it's called a sternal a support pillow. 
And uh, so I had one. I had a little pillow. She said, they had a pillow they ordered. And she said, I thought you would like it. And, and she took a picture of it. So I went on Amazon. Thank God for Amazon. <laughs> Here's the pillow. Saved by Jesus and an amazing heart surgeon. <laughs> and so I bought this pillow. And she, I told her I was going to do it. I said, I'm going to buy that pillow. She goes, you don't need it. You're already past your surgery. You don't need that sternal support. I said, no, I'm not buying it for that. I'm buying it as a reminder. Jesus saved my life. And he used you to save my life. You see, when you live every day knowing he is life, you know that he saves you. He fills your life with good things. He's there for you every day. And so today, he's our truth. He's our life. And he's the way. Do you know him? Do you really believe that? Now, I think, as I was reading that scripture, the way you live this scripture is you just put your trust in him. What did he say? Believe in me. Believe in me. Do you believe in him? Years ago, I ran across this book. It's called The Nevertheless Principle. And um, a lady actually dared me to read it. She said, read this book. And I got it and read it, and I'll never forget this book. This was a missionary who, uh, she and her husband had three small children, and he was diagnosed with cancer, and he died. And she was left to be a single mom of three small children. She was so frustrated. She was so upset with God. Why would you do this to me? She said everywhere she went, she saw families together and moms that had husbands helping. And, and he said, she said it was just, she had just felt like God had taken something away and it wasn't fair. And she started having a dream. You got to hear this. The dream was she was at a park. And every ki everything happening at the park, it was children. They were all running around playing, having a good time. Every one of them had an ice cream cone. My kind of park, right? They were running around, had ice cream cones. And she said she'd see all these kids with ice cream cones in the dream. And then she looked, and there was a little boy sitting on a park bench who didn't have an ice cream cone. In her dream, she would start over to that kid because she wanted to tell him, I know how you feel. Because I don't have a husband. I don't have the father of my children. I know how you feel. But she'd always wake up right before she got to him. Now she had to dream twice that way. The third time she had the dream. This time, she got to have a conversation with him. And she sat down and she said, hey, I know how you feel. All these kids have ice cream cones, but you don't have any. I want to buy you one because I know how that feels. He looks at her and goes, do you know who I am? And she goes, no. He goes, my dad owns Baskin Robbins. I can have all the ice cream I want. And she woke up from the dream. And the Lord said, I'm all you need. I have everything for you. Jesus is everything. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. I want you to bow with me just for a second. Do you know him? And by that, I don't mean do you know about him? Do you know him personally? Have you ever said, Jesus, I want to get to know you. I want, I want you to have my life. I want to follow you. I'd like to lead you in a prayer because I just believe that he hears your prayer and that he answers it. So with our heads bowed and on the stream, if you just pause where you are and what's happening, and please join us in this. Just, let's pray this. Jesus, thank you for what you said in the verse we read today. Thank you for saying you are the way, the truth, the life. Jesus, I believe you, and I give you my life today. I'm going to stop living for me and living in my sins and all my mistakes, and I'm going to live for you with your help. 
And I'm going to follow you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name. Amen. As you look this way, I just believe anyone in this room that, that somehow, even quietly from your heart or your voice, that prayer, he heard you. He heard you. And guess what? He is the way now and the truth and the life in you. And you will see things and experience things that it's hard to describe. We want to help you with that. You can let one of us know. You can also talk to somebody out there and just say, hey, I prayed that prayer and I want to know what that next step is. You can text us. Text the word next to 40777. I thought the best way to end this service on the week of the Holy Week is to just make a declaration. The, the, the band, the band started with this declaration. That's my king. I pray every one of you today can say, oh, Jesus, yeah, that's my king. Let's stand together and let's praise him. That's my king. That's my God, that's my shepherd, my protector, that's my king, that's my rock, that's my anchor. o'clock for our night of worship or we'll see you next weekend for Easter weekend. Go have a great Holy Week.